Hello aviators, Sky here, and we continue traveling the world of expensive and luxury corporate jets with one of its flagships, Gulfstream Airspace. I should remind you that the first two models of this brand were created in Grumman and were, let's say, the proto Gulfstreams, while the third model was born in an independent company but was more of a modernization of the second. This solution looks quite boring. They slightly enlarged the fuselage, improved the wing and the onboard equipment, leaving most of the design and engines the same. According to the modern logic, we can say that Grumman created the Gulfstream 2 and their successors created something like a Gulfstream 2S. There were two main reasons for this decision. First, the company, that recently was separated from its parent, had difficulties with finances, production and technology, so they simply had no resources for breakthroughs in aviation. Secondly, in the 1970s, at the time the Gulfstream 3 was being developed, it actually had no competitors. All aircraft were either smaller business jets or, on the contrary, large corporate aircraft, often converted from commercial airliners. This allowed the company to relax a bit, not worrying that someone will move them aside. But, since we have a king of the mountain, there will always be a hungry wolf that will try to throw him off. The role of a hungry wolf was taken by Canadair, that in the late 1970s, along with Bill Lear, the father of Learjet, created the Challenger, the plane that, ironically, was an actual challenge. The Canadair Challenger was very good, had many modifications, offered several engines, accommodated up to 19 passengers and flew at a distance of 7000 kilometers, or nearly 3800 miles. It was a direct competitor to Gulfstream, and it was superior. Naturally, Gulfstream had to do something new and cool. This time, the idea of a compromise was rejected almost completely. The project, which received the name Gulfstream 4, was to become the apogee of engineering and the dream of any passenger. To accomplish this task, Gulfstream invested all their efforts and, moreover, they cooperated with Grumman, the former, let's say, father of the program. The work unfolded in full force by 1983. As a basis, naturally, they took the Model 3. With all its obsolescence, it was quite good. The challenge was to provide an even greater level of comfort while achieving the best flight performance. The solution was a large-scale modernization of the airframe. First of all, they started with the wing. It was required to reduce the mass and aerodynamic resistance to obtain better flight capabilities, lower maintenance costs and increase the flight range. This was achieved in a rather difficult way. The fact is that the third model had excellent mechanization, which Gulfstream were very proud of and were not going to change. In addition, the complex design of the fuselage and center wing box made their redesign undesirable. And a bonus was the fact that most of the infrastructure available to customers and operators was adapted to the dimensions of the old planes, so the length of the fuselage could vary, but changing the wingspan was not advised which means that they had to give the wing new properties without changing anything about it. Just perfect. The engineers had to think outside the box. The rear edge of the wing was left almost unchanged, but the front was slightly shifted, which reduced the sweep but increased the wing area by about 1.5 square meters with the same span. A larger wing area allowed to reduce the minimal flight speed to ensure the best takeoff and landing performance of a potentially heavier aircraft. Redesigning a part of the internal structure allowed to increase the volume of fuel tanks in the wing, and new materials minimized weight and improved aerodynamic quality. The tail also underwent modifications. Its design was optimized and the span of the horizontal stabilizer slightly increased. There were no restrictions. The overall height of the aircraft remained the same. Well, almost, it grew by one inch. Of course the alterations did not end there. Next was the fuselage. The nose section was barely touched, it was already completely new on the third model, but the cabin was enlarged again by more than a meter, adding another, the sixth window. The total length of the aircraft reached the mark of almost 27 meters, or 88 feet, plus 5 feet to the model G3. The plane became larger, but curiously, due to the new design and materials, it turned out to be lighter than the G3. A bigger maximum takeoff weight was achieved almost entirely due to the bigger amount of fuel. The avionics of the aircraft were almost completely replaced, which made it possible not only to optimize the piloting, but also greatly simplify maintenance. 
In addition, the Gulfstream 4 was the first business jet in the world to receive a glass cabin. The FS complex included six CRT monitors. Not the modern LCD displays, but at that time it was wildly cool and was used only on the newest airliners. Finally, the most obvious upgrade of the aircraft, which everyone had long been looking forward to. Gulfstream abandoned the outdated Spey engine in favor of a new fiery heart. However, they remained loyal to the British motorists. The Gulfstream 4 was equipped with a pair of Rolls-Royce Tay turbofan engines. These engines appeared literally at the time of the G4 creation, were based on the old Spey, but were much more efficient, had a greater bypass ratio, a new titanium fan, the FedEx control system and other innovations. Later, in addition to the Gulfstream, they were also used on the Fokker regional airliners, and, in the 1990, they were even installed on the Boeing 727 as part of the remotorization programs. In addition to profitability, they had another bonus. With 61.5 kN of thrust, they were 20% more powerful than space, and given the fact that the G4 was just 1.5 tons heavier in comparison to the G3, its thrust to weight ratio increased significantly. Along with the improvements of the airframe quality, the flight performance of the Gulfstream 4 for that time was simply amazing. The plane had a cruising speed of about 900 km per hour, or 490 miles per hour, and flew at a distance of 7800 km, or 4200 miles. The old G3 had never dreamt of anything like it. A rather vivid example of how much influence can the quality of assembly and equipment have. Such a difference in capabilities of two almost indistinguishable aircraft. The work was very ambitious and was conducted at a high pace. Already in the early 1985, the first G4 prototype was assembled and made its maiden flight in the fall. However, many of the changes that were made required complex certification, which ended only in the spring of 1987. At the same time, the first series plane with the number 1000 was delivered to the customer. The aircraft was successful and was actively supplied both domestically and internationally, replacing the G3 model on the production line. Naturally, almost immediately after the start of deliveries of civilian versions, the creation of the Special and the Military C-20 Gulfstream 4 modifications began, which became additions to the earlier versions of C-20 converted from the Gulfstream 3. They were delivered to the US military as special transport, cargo and passenger vehicles, accommodating up to 26 people. They are still flying as a part of the Air Force, Navy, Army and the Marines, and in general are very popular. The corporate adventures were not over, of course. In 1985, after the creation of the aircraft, the cost of Gulfstream Aerospace jumped into the sky, but their financial situation was not very stable. Then, the company was bought by Chrysler, which at that time were very cool and rich and decided to diversify their car business, also adding the aviation division. The company got better, they even flew into the Fortune 500 list. However, Chrysler's idea of diversifying didn't stick, and in 1989 Gulfstream was once again sold to the group of investors led by Alan Paulson. Daddy had returned his baby home. After the return of the company, a new stage of the project development began. The G4 entered the age of modifications. By that moment, about 180 aircraft were delivered. The first upgrade of the base was the Gulfstream 4 Special Performance, or SP project, within which many changes were made to some of the structural elements and onboard systems. This allowed to increase takeoff weight and improve flight performance, optimizing maintenance costs. In 1992, the G4SP replaced the basic plane, technically becoming its second generation. The 90s were a time of rapid development of the company, when they took some serious steps. In 1995, the newest Gulfstream 5 made its maiden flight. Having absorbed the best solutions and technologies, it offered not only comfort and flexibility, but also a range of 6500 miles, or 12,000 kilometers, becoming the first ultra-long range business jet in the world. However, the G5 was not a substitute for the G4, which was not going to leave the market, which means that Gulfstream for the first time was setting up mass production of two aircraft in parallel. 
Another major step was the large-scale modernization of the company's maintenance network. They bought the MRO centers from the KC Aviation Company in several US cities, and also built their own huge service center in Georgia. And again, in the late 1990s, the company was sold, for good this time. Gulfstream Airspace had been acquired by General Dynamics Corporation, its current owner. General Dynamics made major changes to the Gulfstream business jet model. The fact is that they tried to create their own aviation division by buying the Galaxy Airspace from the Israel IAI, which was also creating business jets. They were now trying to assemble all these planes into a single product line, which was not very successful. The problem was that the Galaxy planes, which were modified and renamed the Gulfstream G100 and G200, were supposed to become junior models of the company, while the G4SP and G5 were to become seniors, complementing each other. It was decided to remake the middle aircraft, applying the new requirements. The G4SP was replaced by its upgraded versions that also received new names, the basic G400 and the G300, with a slightly shorter fuselage. But their production didn't last long. In 2003 to 2005, Gulfstream implemented a large-scale G4X modernization program, which resulted in a pair of Gulfstream G350 and G450. At first glance, these planes are almost the same, they have the same dimensions, capacity, engines, but differ in the number of applied onboard systems and fuel reserves. The G350 is a more modest option, having a range of up to 7000 km or 3800 miles, and the basic G4SP package with some improvements. While the G450 is equipped with avionics mostly from the flagship model G550, the newest Gulfstream 5. Plus, due to the increased fuel capacity, the aircraft is heavier and has a range of up to 8000 km or 4800 miles. And of course, it is more expensive. The youngest models cost about 35 million dollars, and the bigger one more than 40 million. Not the cheapest of toys. To say that the G4 family was successful would be an understatement. Over the entire production period since the 1980s until in fact 2018, more than 900 business jets of all versions were delivered, and most of them are actively flying and are being offered on the secondary market. It was the G4 model that became the moment of truth that turned the relatively successful Gulfstream Corporation into one of the leaders of the business aviation industry. Nevertheless, the age of this bestseller is also coming to an end. In 2018, the 365th business jet of the G450 model left the factory, becoming the final step of a large campaign that lasted more than 30 years. Now it is being replaced by the new Gulfstream G500 generation, which we will also meet soon. And that's it for today. Like the video and subscribe to the channel. Luxurious flights and soft landings to you.